So Brett, advancing is going to talk about advancing the science of the moon, progress towards achieving the goals of the scientific context for exploration of the moon report. Thank you, Brett. I can help get back on schedule here, I think, too. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm representing this uh, great group here that um, made up the um, Advancing Science of the Moon specific action team. And so this is the ASM SAT. Um, so this group um, was convened um, at the request of Dr. Green um, and commissioned by League. And we met in August. We had a great time discussing things over a couple of days in August. And our charter here was to evaluate progress on um, the lunar science goals and concepts that were laid out in the 2007 Scientific Context for the Exploration of the Moon Report, also known as the SCEM Report, already mentioned several times today. Um, we were, we also considered um, concepts related to science implementation, secondary science um, opportunities that were described in the SCEM report as well. And then also, um, besides evaluating what was there, our goal was to um, talk about what new science goals and concepts have arisen since the publication of that report. So the SCEM report. Um, this was uh, a report published by the National Research Council, and it was performed at the request of um, the SMD, Science Mission Directorate at the time. Um, and it was, um, the goal was to give guidance on what was then the newly established vision for space exploration, which was going to be these ESMD, um, now HEO, but, um, led lunar missions. Um, and so really, um, as described in the report, they say NASA needs a comprehensive, well-validated, and prioritized set of science, scientific research objectives for a program of exploration of the moon. And so um, if you, probably many of you have read this. If you haven't, or if it's been a long time since you've actually read through it, I really encourage you to go through it again. Um, it's a highly readable document. It will leave you, you know, very excited for um, all of the reasons that we should be studying the moon, not just for lunar science, for earth science, for solar system science. Uh, so we've just been talking about priorities here a bit, and we're not going to prioritize landing sites, but this SCEM document does have a prioritized list of science concepts and of science goals. So I just go through briefly here what these um, eight prioritized science concepts are in priority order, although the report makes great pains to emphasize that all are loved, all are important. So the first one, um, the bombardment history of the inner solar system is uniquely revealed on the moon. I like reading these two because the wording for each of them was um, clearly very carefully thought through. And so these are our great concepts just to go through. Um, number two, the structure and composition of the lunar interior provide fundamental information on the evolution of a differentiated planetary body. Three, key planetary processes are manifested in the diversity of lunar crustal rocks. Four, the lunar poles are special environments that may bear witness to the volatile flux over the latter part of solar system history. Five, lunar volcanism pro provides a window into the thermal and compositional evolution of the moon. Six, the moon is an accessible laboratory for studying the impact process on planetary scales. Seven, the moon is a natural laboratory for regolith processes and weathering on anhydrous airless bodies. And the final one, processes involved with the atmosphere and dust environment of the moon are accessible for scientific study while the environment remains in a pristine state. This was before all of these landed missions were going to go and muck up the ex exosphere. I won't go through all of these. But I'll note that um, each of the eight science concepts, these kind of overarching statements, have 
um, prioritized science goals that go, so there's 40 some of these goals. The um, NRC group also went through and came up with the top 11. So um, things like test the cataclysm hypothesis, age of South Polican Basin, um, et cetera. So um, what did our group do? Um, well, we went through and assessed progress based on all of these recent missions that have happened since the publication of the report. There's a lot of them. The restoration and reexamination of older data sets, um, all kinds of technological developments that have happened in the last decade, advances in modeling, and of course, just you know, new thinking, new ideas. Um, so we went through each of these goals and um, I'll just give one example here of what we did, the, the goal and then kind of the up, updates on progress that has been made in the past 10 years toward um, achieving that goal. So we'll go with the um, highest priority one that was listed. 1A, test the cataclysm hypothesis by determining the spacing and time of the lunar basins. So first of all, why was this prioritized so highly? Um, well, as described in the report, um, you know, the, the moon is our record of the impact, impacts that were occurring on the Earth-Moon system. They're not preserved on the Earth in the same way, and so we looked to the moon to see what was happening um, to the early Earth as well. And so if the embryum impact, the impact event that caused the embryum basin, you can see this uh, uh, big embryum basin over a thousand kilometers here. Um, if it occurred on Earth, it would have vaporized the oceans and sterilized the crust to depths of hundreds of meters. And so the big question is, was there a, a spike of large impacts, such as uh, embryon size impacts, around the time that embryon formed 3.9 billion years ago? Um, if there was a huge flux of these impacts occurring in quick succession, that would have had profound um, effects on the emergence of life on Earth. It's thought that you need a kind of quiescent period for life to kind of regain its foothold um, between these impacts. So if there was a big spike, what did that do to the emergence of life on Earth? Migration of the giant planets um, that might have uh, destabilized the orbits of these impactors, throwing them into the inner solar system. And because these were impactors were potentially coming from the outer solar system, delivery of volatiles to the inner solar system as well. So um, progress toward this goal, what's, what's happened in the past 10 years? Obviously, we have not answered this question, and we don't have new samples that have given us um, a means to answer it. But there's still been a lot of different kinds of progress um, looking at um, both the samples that we already do have and then these new data sets to kind of give context and reinterpretation of the origins of the samples. So there had been what passes for kind of a general consensus um, in the lunar science community about the relationships of samples to Imbrium, Serenitatis, and Nectaris, all forming um, very closely in time around 3.9 billion years ago. Um, and then using stratigraphic relationships, pin down the ages of other basins as well. So for Serenitatis, there has been um, work in the last decade that um, kind of reopens the question of whether these samples do indeed date the Serenitatis impact event that were collected at Apollo 17 on the rim of the Serenitatis Basin. But um, perhaps um, there, there's actually strong geologic evidence that some of the sculptured hill, hills materials that you can see in this image here actually originated from Imbrium and is over printing that site. There's also some um, sample work as well um, that supports the idea that these samples um, may not necessarily be from Serenitatis. For Nectaris, um, in the uh, Descartes formation, um, there has been some sample work as well, kind of reopening that question and supporting this geologic interpretation um, that the Descartes formation as well may be Imbrium ejected, not re related to um, Nectaris. So if, you, um, if the sculptured hills and the Descartes formation are related to Imbrium, that really kind of removes age constraints on basins older than Imbrium and reopens this 
pre imbrium impact history to debate. Or it's always been under debate, <laughs> but it, it's, a, it's still um, potentially removing some of these constraints so that we can continue to debate. And we will continue to debate um, eternally uh, without uh, more samples. So um, the importance of this question has really only grown in the past decade. And some of the other progress that has been made is um, a whole variety of work looking to identify probable deposits of basin melt that could be targeted for future in situ or um, sample return um, analyses. So, um, you know, without these kinds of geochemical and geochronological analyses of key melt deposits that we can, um, without um, question, tie to particular impact events, the spacing and time of the lunar basins and all of these other um, implications for um, solar system science, you know, that will all remain um, unknown. So we went through each of the goals in this manner. Um, obviously, there's not time to describe 40-some um, of them. Um, each section, um, we've tried to end with a summary of progress that is still needed. Um, we did not make any effort to reprioritize the goals, um, as we've already discussed. Um, that is a big can of worms, um, and there was a huge effort that went into the prioritization of these goals in the first place, so we did not touch that. Um, but we did identify uh, the new concepts and goals that have emerged um, in the past 10 years. So one of these is the lunar uh, water cycle. And um, that is not to say that volatiles were not discussed in the SCEM report. They were, um, but they were kind of scattered throughout different concepts and goals. And so they didn't really kind of bring it together into the picture that we have now and were perhaps not given their full importance that, as we see it now. So work from the last decade points to um, this water cycle with three components that include uh, primordial, primordial or interior water, uh, surficial water linked to the solar wind, and then uh, polar water that is sequestered in cold traps. And so um, goals for um, this kind of uh, concept here would be um, to identify and characterize these volatile reservoirs and evaluate their uh, interrelationships. So um, the composition and variability of the endogenous volatiles that are entrained in volcanic products, um, exposed uh, in impact events at, um, in some places, um, determine the sources of mid-latitude surface hydroxyl in water and determine how it migrates you know, is it related to the polar volatiles? Uh, determine um, the sources of the polar volatiles. Um, a second um, concept that um, we felt had kind of um, reemerged in importance um, is the origin of the moon. We have, you know, the, the giant impact uh, hypothesis, but um, a key goal of studying the moon is to better understand the origin and accretion of the um, inner planets. And the moon's deep interior um, is a vault that really contains a treasure trove of information about its initial composition um, during and immediately after accretion. So the specific goals that um, could go along with this topic would be to look at the timing of the collision uh, mechanisms timing extent of volatile depletion in the moon, uh, the composition of the impactor, uh, the compositions and processes that um, occurred in the protolunar disk, and then the conditions and processes that um, were uh, occurring at the surface of the lunar magma ocean, including um, the composition and the longe longevity of um, an early lunar atmosphere. And finally, something that was uh, not really included in the SCEM report was um, lunar tectonism and seismicity. And uh, in the last decade, due to the greatly expanded high resolution um, image coverage, there's been really an explosion in the um, 
discovery of uh, lunar tectonic features, particularly lobate scarps. And um, those are important because without plate tectonics, the number, the distribution of those scarps, the level of seismicity, uh, provide information on the interior structure, thermal history, and uh, the mechanisms of the moon's heat loss as it cooled. So as that moon cooled, leading to global contraction, um, you would develop these scarps, which would expect to be somewhat randomly oriented. There's new evidence that they are not completely randomly oriented, and there may be stresses from uh, tides and from lunar recession. And these stresses are active today, so these um, scarps may be active today, and there's also some geologic evidence that some of these scarps um, have been active very recently. So um, perhaps these lobate scarps can explain shallow moonquakes, the uh, rarest but um, strongest uh, events. And um, if so, regions with active scarps could be targeted for seismic analyses, um, but avoided for um, you know, long-term um, surface assets, such as uh, an outpost. So um, conclusions. Um, I think it was the you know really strong feeling of everyone who met as part of this group that the concepts and goals outlined in the SCEM report remain relevant after a decade of progress in lunar science. There were some um, of these goals that had had a substantial amount of progress, um, but none were really you could we couldn't agree on a single one that you could just check off the list and call it done. Um, and nearly all of the goals did have some progress as well. But as you saw with going through this example of um, 1A, uh, the impact bombardment history, um, that progress is kind, kind of pushing us toward um, being able to better answer the question, better pick um, samples, et cetera, not necessarily having answered the question. Um, and as described, these new goals and concepts have emerged. Um, in general, a lot learned, but still um, an enormous amount left to do. And um, for this meeting in particular, um, I just want to emphasize that we are now in a much stronger position to take advantage of landed missions um, and to identify ideal landing sites, as you'll hear in this meeting that um, will address these uh, SCEM goals and concepts. And um, while we all felt there's you know, clearly still real and important progress to be made from orbital missions, many of these high priority goals um, simply require landed missions. Um, and I will leave you with this beautiful image and the um, favorite quote from my co-chair of the committee, um, Sam Lawrence. All right, thank you. Questions for, all right. Questions. <laughs> Questions for Brett. Has the ASM report been published? Can we get Say our hands again? on it? If You've got a microphone and I can't hear you. That's <laughs> bizarre. You can't hear me? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think you've just switched it off. But. All right, has just the yet. ASM report been published? Repeat the question. All right, Repeat so has the report been published from this ASM SAT? Um, the report is now being revised. It will be published at the end of the month. Um, I assume it will go on the league website, um, but yeah, that's why we wanted to kind of publicize it here so it doesn't just, you know, end up as a link on a website somewhere that nobody clicks on because uh, I think it, it'll be a, a good um, update to the SCEM report that we can kind of use together with it as a kind of guiding um, going forward. Did, um did you spend any time, dis or your group spend any time discussing what, which of the science goals might be best addressed by a human presence on the moon versus just robotic versus ro robots and humans cooperating? Um, the, so the SCEM report has um, an extensive discussion of implementation options, and they go through for each 
concept. Um, what can you learn from you know mining existing data? What can you learn from orbital data? What can you learn from lander? And what um, can you learn from having um, humans on the surface of the moon? So we, I think, felt. Um, I think uh, without exception um, for all of the goals that the implementation just um, described in this GEM report was still uh, valid. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, how are you thinking about unique science payloads to address the science issues that you've talked about? I mean, the details of payload volumes or payload technologies, and how is the group thinking about those problems? Uh, we are not. <laughs> that was not part of our discussion, the specific um, payloads or specific missions to address it, but more to give guidance to when there are missions, missions of opportunity, um, human exploration of the moon, any kind of mission. Um, basically, what, can, what kind of mission can you give us? We can, <laughs> we can focus that to address some of these goals. And I think you should... Uh probably recognized uh, in your introduction in this report when you publish it that an important uh, adjunct to that the original uh, National Research Council uh, report was uh, Brad Jolliffe's effort uh, at uh, for the uh, NASA Advisory Council in the Tempe workshop which dug into a I think a little bit more deeply into those kind of objectives <laughs> but related specifically to the Constellation program. Uh, still, I think, a very important document. And thank you, Brad, again <laughs> for chairing that workshop. Yeah, so also, that was the landing site workshop, yeah. I really wish, and everybody's heard me talk about I really wish you would be a little more uh, objective on the question of the origin of the moon. Uh, you really, that's a hypothesis, and you were right to say it was a hypothesis, but I, I, I would hope that we would encourage people to start to look at what other alternatives are there to explain the vast amount of information we now have that we didn't have before uh, those models started to be developed for a uh, giant impact. Uh, and, uh, and then finally, I would uh, recommend that you at least take a, a glance at our recent Icarus paper which uh, changes some of the information, I think, that uh, was presented to in your, in your work. Yeah, so this is just a summary of in general, but we did make a strong effort to include all of the recent publications um, relevant to these goals. So um, I guess it brooks the question, you know, you, now you've done the study, um, is it time to do a SCHEM2 report to um, get the academies to do that? And is it particularly timely as we're rolling towards the next decadal survey? Um, I guess, speaking for myself, I would have kind of mixed feelings about that. I mean, we are, okay, there's two parts of this. The science update, um, what new progress has been made in the last 10 years was our goal here. And that, I mean, we're writing a book about that, New Views of the Moon too. So, um, but also, um, I mean, the SCHEM report was written in anticipation of this return to the moon um, and a lot of um, planning that did not come to pass. Um, so a lot of the goals are still completely and directly relevant to you know going back to the moon now. Um, and I think with the updates that we're kind of describing here, um, a few new concepts that have emerged, um, I don't think you would need to completely redo the SCAM report. Um, there is nothing in there that is no, no longer valid, really. Um, and the prioritization is, you know, while always subjective, is, is still, I think, many of us could agree on. Junichi gets the last word. <laughs> Scary for everybody. Uh, I'm from Japan. Uh, thank you very much, Mirami, uh, for your uh, good review. And, but uh, I want to know, uh, where do you want to go? Where 
do you, uh, do you think um, the best place to explore on the moon? No, no, no. You are old generation. I want to know that you are young generation. <laughs> Actually, I think uh, uh, exploration uh, is um, uh, led by the, some people now who has an enthusiasm to explore. So that I want to know that your generation, where do you want to go? Your private comment. Okay, so you're asking me to speak for my entire generation. <laughs> um, <laughs> but sure, why not? <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, what is, what, what I would personally love is <laughs> this idea of having just a very long-lived kind of, um, for starters, a rover that we can really go and explore all, I mean, you can, you can explore Reiner Gamma, you can explore Marius Hills, you can get up to Aristarchus, all in this really fascinating area. You can learn about pyroclastic deposits. Um, there are, are pits um, there. So, yeah, that's, I, I could start there. Um. <laughs> you have to talk afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Brett. Thanks. Thank you.